Hey, welcome back, you guys, to the podcast. Uh, thanks, by the way, for all those great uh, comments and thoughts on last week's Your Brain on Art, uh, the interview with Susan and Ivy. Uh, for those of you guys who haven't listened to that, uh, go go check it out. It's amazing. I'm still <laughs> I'm still reeling from that and all the information that was shared that day. So, anyway, um, I wanted to talk to you today about objectivity and this idea that or the tendency to think that we are our art and uh, the problems that that arise from that thinking. So there are some benefits to being objective, to having objectivity. And this has been something that has helped me so, so much and something that I coach a lot on um, with with artists and I see it in our programs. I see it in destination workshops. And it's it's a sort of loose hold of your art when you're making it. It's a kind of, you know, if you're white knuckling it and you're really attached, really attached, it's almost impossible <laughs> to make something that is that is uh, like yourself because that isn't really who you are. It's almost the, the clinging version of you. And of course, you know, in destination workshops, there's always this nervous energy. People come and they want to be successful. They've come all this way and, and <clears throat> there's this sort of pressure. And it's usually the first day or two, there's some rough patches that people work through and then they kind of get over it and they get, get to the business at hand, uh, get more relaxed and not so worried about it. Um, but, uh, you know, relating to this conversation I had last week, you know, around, uh, you know, with Ivy on, on this book, your, your brain on art and talking about, uh, emotions and how emotions actually move through you. That's what they're designed. Uh, it's like, it's like good and bad weather. We're here to experience all those all the ranges of emotions and none of them are bad. And, and, you know, obviously we don't like it when we have a challenging emotions, um, negative thoughts or whatever, but it's, that's not going to really change the fact that we are going to. The problems arise when these emotions don't pass through us, when they get stuck. And that's where all the suffering comes from. Um, we, if we're not able to let go of the idea that this art making thing, we're eligible for it. Or if you believe the stories that some bad art teacher told you that you don't have any talent, you know, this is, you're stuck in this place and your art gets stuck. You get stuck. It's why we get stuck in our life. It's it, these blocked emotions. So we, we want to let them, uh, we want to let them kind of run, run through us. And, and it's this loose hold that, we realize that perceptions about our art and what it is, is it is not us. It's something we're making right now. You know, I always, I always, uh, I used to do a lot of running. I still do a lot of running, but I used to do these little races on the weekends. And, and at first I was terrified because this is it, you know, you're going to be value evaluated in front of everyone when you come in mostly close to last, which is where I came in. And I'd never really done a lot of competitive sports before, but uh, so this was really challenging for me to, to, to sort of every month show up kind of at the end of a race. And I had to get kind of comfortable with this. And the way I did it was I was, I would describe my situation. Well, how did it go? Well, I kind of came in, you know, five, you know, 25th out of 30 people. But that's what I did that day. That was the best I could do that day, actually. So there was this possibility that I was going to somehow become something much greater, which, you know, didn't really happen. But it's, it's just, this is where your art is today. It doesn't preclude you from making much, much better work right? It doesn't preclude you from, uh, you know, loving what you make or selling more in the future. It's just, it's just where you are right now. And this 
you will pass through this. This is just this phase. What, what we're looking to do is by not attaching ourselves to our art so much, we're looking to, we're looking to, uh, for one, not, not get crushed, uh, by the reaction. So this, the first benefit of, of, of objectivity is that, you know, you can see your art, you can perceive your art more like it is, uh, if it's, if it's not attached to you. You, you can get some distance on it and look at it. And if it's not great, it's no reflection on you. It's just what you did on that day and it's going to change. And it's just this constant movement forward. Uh, <clears throat> understanding that we're, we're separate from it allows us to not get so attached to if somebody doesn't like it. And on the flip side, if somebody does like it, we don't wanna get so attached to that either, because that doesn't serve you either. It sort of can be distracting. We want to drop into the the process more of making it. But I th I found this really great thing that happened to me. Actually, was in a therapist uh, session, and I was talking about I was going through a really hard patch and and just feeling kind of worthless and. This can happen. I think we all walk around sometimes feeling less than. And uh, and I you start to believe this. Because you feel something, you start to believe it. And this is what's dangerous. If you feel like and you start hanging out with the idea that you don't like your work or that it's not good, then if you think because you're your art that you're not good, all of this. But this therapist had this great way of looking at it. He said, Nick, listen, you know, you know, the fact is, like, if you can identify and notice those feelings of worthlessness, if you can just bring awareness to it as they rise up in you, then, then you're separate from them. And he goes, the reason you know that is because you're looking at it. If you're looking at the thing and you can see it, it means you're over here looking at the thing. And I think that's, I think that's a really great way to describe uh, and, and a workaround to, to some of these uh, challenging feelings that we have, that they're just passing through and, and they're supposed to, and then that's totally fine. Um, uh, so this, the strategy for this kind of the workaround that I have, I have found helpful is to really think about your art making um, as your process that the art making thing is um, is a process of you becoming you, and and <clears throat> so not so much focused on what it is that you're making, whether it's good or bad, but more this is what you're doing. This is your practice, and that you're figuring you out through this art making thing. And you can definitely so when you make a mistake or you don't like something. The question, the a good question becomes, did I learn something? Because if you learn something, good or bad, then you've got more information now to, to, um, to progress, to change, and to modify. And that's suddenly you're outside of yourself a little bit. Um, and, and so that taking the emphasis out, out of the thing and judging the, judging your, art based on your practice is is a much better healthier way to think of it um, because that's the thing that's going to stay with you your whole life and that's the thing if that gets better um, then your art is automatically going to get better so that's a really powerful benefit getting that clarity being able to being able to see things more objectively and to do that it means you don't, you can't be the object. You have to perceive it off to the side. So that's the first thing. the The second benefit to this objectivity is is around um, learning uh, and and changing faster. Uh, there's a huge benefit um, to being open to change, and this is really, I think. For me, and I think for all of us, one of the one of the main things we're learning in this art making process that 
we try to predict it <laughs> and it, it won't be fun if you try to predict exactly how this is going to come out. You don't know what it's going to be. You're, you just have to go on faith a little bit and you have to be open to the possibility that this thing is going to be different when you make it and, and paying attention to what it's telling you. And maybe it's going to be different than what you thought and you're going to go in a different direction. Um, so I love that idea that, you know, they talk about this in communication that if you're you're waiting for the person to stop talking so you can tell them what you think, which is so easy to do. We're just like, come on, get over with it. And so then I can tell you what I know instead of this idea, which <clears throat> I've had challenges with, is just listening for learning something new. Be prepared to learn something by what somebody's telling you. By in, in, in this example, what's your art? Being prepared to listen more, being more open to what it is your art has to say to you. And, and this, this is going to allow your work to evolve because if you can pay attention, if you can pay attention better, then the thing that you're making and what the innermost part of you is wanting to create for yourself, where it's going to be going will arise faster and that change will be quicker. For example, if we're, we're making our art and I got in a situation like this where my gallery liked a certain kind of thing and it was really successful for them and for me too. And it felt good because they liked it and I got a lot of feedback, but uh, it, it started to die for me and it was no longer what I was really needing to make. It didn't coincide necessarily with what the gallery wanted. And I know a lot of you can relate to this, but it was what was calling me to make what was really was, was I was feeling I needed to do. And this is what's so cool about art. It's just so not practical in a way, but because it's following your soul's desire. It's following just the hunches of what you think intuitively. What is it that I need to make, right? What is, what does this need to be? What is this, does this part feel more like me? Where is the part of this that lights it up for me? Um, and, and so just, it's, it's all about this perspective, right? You know, we, we have this perception of our art, uh, and, and we think that other people have a perspective of it that's ours. And I, I think of my work a certain way. And I think that everyone else thinks of my work a certain way. And I get really critical of my work if I can't make it do something or if I don't like a certain thing about it. And that's fine. But I think that everyone else cares about those things too. And I've come to realize that people don't even think about my art the way I do at all. And it's kind of liberating. Um, and that I actually have much more freedom than I thought I did. Because if I think of my work it has to be a certain thing, and I'm thinking, well, everyone thinks my work's kind of this loose abstract, and it's kind of wild, and that's how every, then, then I've got all these people in the room with me and I, and, and that, and it limits me because I've got this, I've, I've got this perspective that is smaller. You know, it's really interesting, uh, in India, the, the color of mourning, and I actually got this from reading the, your brain on art and that the color in India for mourning is white. You know, but here in the U.S., it's black. And I do not think of white as a color of, of kind of somber introspection at all. But it's just my perspective and where I'm sitting. Uh, I remember I had a crazy thing as a kid where I, this really landed for me. I had a, my father um, got me this uh, kite um, kit, you know, where you can make kites and you had to, you had to kind of do a lot of it yourself, but you got the sticks and it was just a typical like triangular kite. 
and you had to cut, you had to get your own tissue paper and it had a whole, a whole, it had the string, you know, all the instructions. But what was cool about it, it came with three or four, uh, the, the paper that came with it, you could paint it. And so you could make, you could do, it was like an art kite basically. And I loved kites and there was this place near us called Kite Hill. Uh, it was in Mill Valley. And unfortunately it just, like I just, they just are developing it now. It's such a bummer, but it is this hill. I mean, it's been there my whole life. Like this hill, as you drive into Mill Valley, California, is crazy. It's just this beautiful grass hill and it never got developed because everyone in the neighborhood loved this and they loved flying kites up there and it was really windy and people would go up there after work. And so, you know, the development plan, they always skirted it. But unfortunately now it's, I see all these story poles on it. But anyway, um, this was this place we'd go called Kite Hill. And I never made a kite before, but so I got this kid. It was a birthday present and I, I didn't know what to do. I was pretty young. I think I was, you know, like 11 or whatever. And I, uh, found this, I looked up, I wanted to do something graphic and I found these symbols in these different books, you know, and, and I painted this thing and, and the colors were amazing. It was red and black. And I, I used, um, I didn't paint it. I used, uh, felt pens cause my dad was, uh, you know, that's what they used back in the day to like design with, you know, he did like marker comps. So he all, we always had these felt pens and it was this kind of like white tissue paper. So it was really vivid. And I did this black and white symbol and I put it on the kite and I was so excited to show my dad, you know, cause he, he was like the artist and, you know, and he would come home from work and, you know, so I got this thing and I got it done and I went upstairs to show him and I was just so excited. And I showed him this kite I'd made with this design on it. And, and instead of being like really excited, he just, he just was totally taken aback. And what I had, the symbol that I had chosen, uh, from a book was a swastika. Um, I just, and I, you know, it's hard to see, Obviously, I didn't understand the historical significance of it. And my father uh, had gone through World War II and, you know, and the whole world knows about a swastika and the suffering and uh, awful side of what that symbol has come to mean. But to me, I just saw it as this beautiful symbol. And, and actually, that symbol was borrowed from much earlier. You know, it was co-opted. Uh, it was historically, it was, it's a thousands of years old. You find that in, in Indonesian art and all kinds of things. But anyway, I, I, he saw this thing, you know, and took me aside and kind of explained like, you can't go flying a kite with this on it, you know? And he, and it was really hard because he had to go into what this was, you know, and explain concentration camps. And I never forgot it because I felt I felt really bad, but it was just my awareness. I was a kid. I didn't have a big awareness, right, of, of everything. So, so the the reframe on this, you know, um, is that uh, that y you can um, you can gain perspective by by listening to, to what the art is, but also a cool way to do it. And I'm reluctant to share this, but I've done this before is to ask some close people what they think of your art. Like, what do they like about your art? You could do this on Instagram, you know, like, you know, these, these check out my work. I'm just curious. What is the one thing that you find significant about my work or what, how would you describe my work? And you just wouldn't believe what people will say. And it's, it's kind of amazing, you know, like you'll gain something from it because if you're trying to make something that is, that is, you know, uh, colorful, vibrant, and feels a certain way, you might gain something from hearing from people who, who might not see it that way. And and then maybe you can adjust things uh, if, if you want. And I'm not saying adjust things to what people are what people are saying. You want to follow what it is you're doing, but this is just a, a way to get outside of yourself a little by just asking those people. And you got to ask the people that understand art, that are close to you, that you know have your best interests. Um, so that's a that's a really uh, a, a way to kind of see it. I I ask myself. 
when I'm looking at something and I'm trying to decide, is this got the right feeling? And what I say to myself, I say, if I asked a hundred people, if they stood in front of this painting and I said, a hundred people just off the street, what does this feel like? Would most of them say X? And if they would, then you're probably, it's coming through clear. And you can see why, uh, if you can get this objectivity, um, that you can change your work faster. I mean, change your work so it's better, faster. You can start getting more cl that clarity and then the work gets stronger. When the work gets stronger, meaning more like you and what you really need and want to say, then that tends to rise to the surface of things when you put that out. And, it's, and it makes better art. It makes better art because it's more personal, which in the fine art world is, is what you want. You want work that feels different, that feels unique, that feels like you. So the third piece of this around objectivity is is kind of interesting and and it's it's around if gaining objectivity will allow uh you and and your art to expand um and i love this one because this is kind of what we do in the creative visionary program our 12 uh week program that we hold in the spring we're, we're doing it right now we work with people on expanding their thinking finding new ways to think about what they're doing. Almost across the board, our thinking about our art is smaller than what it could become. You know, like we don't get out of bed or I don't, and I don't know really anyone who does this, maybe some people, I'm, I don't know anyone, but you don't get out of, out of bed and think, you know, I am so great today and I am crushing it. And I am, um, that's kind of a problem because other people are going to be intimidated by how great I am. I don't know anyone who's like that. We tend to think that we're not doing as well. <laughs> you know, I'm sure if you're an artist and you're listening to this, or if you make something that you have a question mark around what it is you're making and that how could it be good enough? You know, it's really interesting. I listened to the, I watched the Oscars, you know, and, and it's so gratifying and, and kind of connecting when you listen to people who these are like amazing artists, producers and actors and sound technicians, like top of the game. And almost across the board, they're like, they're coming up and, and they are not only just often telling stories of I cannot believe I'm standing here. I can't believe that a dream like this can come true. They, nobody's boasting. They're just for the grace of God. I, I'm standing here. I cannot believe it. And they talk a lot about um, that it's not an I thing. They're talking about their high school teachers. They're talking about the people on their team, the people that their producers, the guy that gave them a break, the amazing writer, the guy who wrote the book, the actor who gave him all this. It just, uh, you know, and I heard it like three times, you know, thank you such and such for letting me stand on your shoulder so I could take, have a possibility to do something meaningful. Thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. Like it's always a we. It's never an us. It's never a me, you know? And, and I think that's not because people have humility, but I think it's because people, because it's true. I don't think we're so good by ourselves. I don't think our art is as good as we just, if we're just trying to make it in a silo. Um, I don't think it's too good if it's always us critiquing it, looking at it, that we're just the, the main person staring at it all the time. Um, so if you can kind of allow other people to be part of your experience, they can mirror back to you sometimes things that you would never think possible. You know, this is what coaching is about. And I've worked with a lot of artists and I've, I've worked with coaches and I still work with coaches. And, and I, I think it is the number one way to get outside of yourself and gain objectivity. And you kind of can't believe it when somebody says, something like, oh my God, you know, you, you, this work, 
could be X or you, this work feels like this, or if you do this, it could be this. You almost can't believe it. And it takes some extra confidence building, uh, buoyancy that's given by somebody else to expand, expand your thinking. You know, I have a, a mastermind that I'm a part of. It's a Stu McLaren is a, a kind of guy who helps people create mission driven businesses and, and run them, which is what art to life is. You know, there's a, the mission of this is to let everyone in the world know that art making is a possibility for them. And it's sitting there if they want to do this, that anybody can be an artist. And that's really important to me to, to share that because I think I had living beliefs and, and then I overcame them. And I, I just want everyone to, who wants to, to experience that. And so anyway, he helps people kind of get this, get this thing going. And, and I listen to a lot of people in other kinds of businesses that are, that are like mine, you know, that they're trying, it's like mission things they're trying to create, whether it's really cool healthcare things or really great things around fitness or whatever. And almost across the board, every person, uh, is trying to offer too much, you know, like we don't think we're good enough. So not only will I teach you, I'll show you a video about how to paint something, but I will create this and I will do that. And then I'll talk to you personally and I'll, you start piling all these things on and it, well, it becomes way too much, but it's just that the, it's just kind of rooted in this idea that we don't see what's possible. We don't see our own value. And you know, this is why like when someone wants to buy your art, you practically give it to them and notoriously artists undersell underprice their work because just giving it to them feels so good, you know, like just feels so good. If someone wants the thing, especially by the way, if you think you are the thing, then it feels really good. But you know, that's related to this, right? It's difficult to price your work. That's another benefit of this. If, if it's you, um, and you're just like a normal human being, just barely hanging on thinking, you know, you're an imposter kind of, which everyone has, it's really hard to put a, a good solid, uh, price on, on your art. That's another piece of it. Um, you know, this idea that it is, that is, we're not enough, um, kind of leaks into this. So, so getting coaching, changing your thinking, making the pot that you live in, getting the bigger studio, getting the better quality paint, putting more paint out on your palette, learning how to be generous with yourself. All these are like learned things we need to do so our art can grow into what it wants to become, right? Like the, the pot needs to become bigger first. You know, art never becomes amazing in the bedroom and then you can afford to get a bigger studio. It almost always happens the other way around. You've got to go out on the skinny branches a little bit of, of your, you know, uh, and take a risk and, and, and say, you know, I'm just going to rent the studio and I mean, I'm just going to go for it and hopefully my work will get better. And it almost always does. That's literally what I'm talking about. Your place, you're working, you give that to yourself, you get an extra bedroom, you move off the kitchen table to an extra bedroom, or you take the garage over, or even just giving yourself a, a table where you can always work. These are the things that allow your work to expand. It's exactly like a plant. So how do we get this expansion? How can we see differently if we're the ones seeing? So I like to think about uh, kind of borrowing perspective and it definitely depends on who you talk to and who you ask. And this is kind of challenging, but you can gain perspective by finding people that are doing what you're doing, who maybe are a little further ahead of you and, and experiencing them. Now, this could be looking at someone's amazing art, you know, like going to the museum. Like I just saw the uh, John Singer Sargent show and, you know, reading about somebody who you admire um, gives you this perspective, gives you like, oh man, he just took off all this time and he did all this traveling and he went to Spain and he went to Mallorca. And, and it kind of reminded me of like, that's been my part of my lifelong dream is to do my art in different places. And I just saw this show uh, on Sunday and 
the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. And, and that gave me a perspective that was different than me, which lately I've just been working and not having enough time to do my studio art. So I tend to not go to museums as much, which is crazy because this is how you can work better. This is how you can expand your art. If you, I've had the great fortune to talk to some pretty amazing artists on this podcast. And part of the motivation of doing this podcast is just to have these really cool conversations to help me and, and hopefully you guys along the way grow and expand. That's the whole point of, of what this podcast is. So that's sort of the, the workaround, you know, to ask somebody, you know, and learn about what they're doing in their art. And it has to kind of align with you. You have to be like inspired by what they're making. But don't forget that that is, that's the number, like the number one way to change your perspective is to kind of like stand over in the corner next to somebody else. And they don't have to necessarily give you a critique of your work, but just by experiencing getting that new book, going visiting, going to an artist talk, going to open studios and going around and seeing what other people are doing, all of that is allows you to expand. And, and so that also is, is a really great way to give yourself objectivity. I mean, getting that you are not this art, you're not your art, and that it's just changing. It's just the thing next to you that's changing as you're changing and getting in the flow with that. Um, is really the key to to getting your art stronger uh, and 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 much much quicker. Anyway, so I hope that was helpful. This is what's been going on in my brain this week. <laughs> and uh, so, listen, uh, if if you're interested uh, in uh, anything that we've just been talking about, we have this really cool feature on the. If you go to arttolifepodcast.com. Uh, there's a little button, a little yellow tab on the right-hand side of this episode on the website. And uh, it says, click to, Nick, at, click to ask Nick a question. So if you have a question, uh, thought about this podcast, uh, it allows you to just record a thing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, continue gathering these up and know that if you're going to record a little question that I might, uh, first of all, I, I can't answer all of them, but I'm going to try to get to some of them and because there's some great questions coming in and I thought it would be cool to not just hear my voice but hear your voice too so know that that's what's going in and I apologize if I can't get to all the questions but I'm going to choose ones that you know are asked repeatedly because those are often the important ones and so listen thanks so much for being here you guys and if you like this podcast and uh, do me a favor and write a review of it, share it with someone. I'd really, really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's kind of cool. Like more people are listening now and it's just, it's the most gratifying feeling. And, and it's, it's happening because you're sharing it and you're showing up and it's this community that we're part of. And I, I just really appreciate that. So um, I will see you next week. Um, I've got a really cool episode coming up. Again, thanks for being here. Okay, bye.